All right, ladies and gentlemen, tonight is uh, lecture 13 of 16, and there's four more. You do the math. Um, okay. Yeah, as I mentioned, I miscounted the weeks. So we're the history of philosophy and 16 questions, but there's going to be 17. Uh, tonight's question is enlightened, question mark, and we're going to explore the enlightenment. Now, if you look at the history of the Renaissance, it kind of, like I said last time, it kind of goes from, say, you know, late 1300s to the mid 1500s. And if you look at the history of the Enlightenment, it sort of goes from, oh, late 1600s to maybe 1800. Again, all these dates are moderately fudgeable, depending on what you want to count, who's scoring and whatnot. So what happened between 1550 and about 1680, 1700, that sort of Renaissance bleh, enlightenment, right? You look at the history, this is how it goes. Renaissance, something, something, enlightenment. Uh, that something, something was the Reformation and the Thirty Years' War. Now, some people count the Thirty Years' War as part of the Reformation. Some people say it was a separate event. In any case, the Reformation is certainly the cause of the Thirty Years' War, and they happen one after the other. So I just want to look at them together to understand where the Enlightenment comes from. So the Reformation means that many of the countries throughout Europe that had been under, at least ostensibly, although very loosely, under the control or rule or in some way uh, dictated to by the Catholic Church break off and become independent. They go Protestant or Calvinist or whatever, but they break away from the Catholic Church. And this really and totally and completely upsets the power structure. So I mentioned this before, but the Catholic Church, if you wanted to get married, you went to the Catholic Church. If you wanted to register your child when they were born, you went to the Catholic Church. If you wanted to move cities, you went to the Catholic Church. If you wanted to do anything, virtually at all, everything involved going through some sort of church agency, office, or rule, or code, or talk to your priest. Of course, heaven and hell, also very important, Catholic Church. So when you removed the Catholic Church, it wasn't like people just said, oh, we're not going to go to church anymore. What happened was is people start saying, well, then how do we get married? How do we, uh, how do we decide wh what to do in church? Who tells us what we're supposed to read, how to pray? Who tells us where we can live? Who tells us what happens to the monasteries? How do we use land? All these things were just integrated into the society, were ripped out. And so this was very disruptive of people's communal existence, particularly in the cities. Um, and that took about, oh, a hundred years to sort out, give or take. So 1517, by the way, Luther's thesis. So you can start the Ref uh, Reformation then, but you know it takes a lot of years for that to kind of roll out and then wars start and people are fighting and everybody's on everybody's side. And then that kind of settles down. And then you get the Thirty Years War. Now the thing about the Thirty Years War is even in the history of warfare, it was awful. Some parts of Germany, Wittenberg, for instance, lost three quarters of its population. Uh, many parts of, the, of, of particularly Central Europe and Germany lost half their population. One of the problems was the armies were uh, mercenaries by and large, and so when they didn't get paid, they would just destroy whatever was around them and, and steal everything. So it wasn't like a controlled group of military men taking territory. It was like a vaguely controlled group of military people doing whatever they wanted. They often changed sides in the middle of battles. They'd often join up with the mercenaries from the other army and go sack something that looked like it would be hugely profitable. So it was just despoilation, destruction, and despair on a massive scale. And of course, when you disrupt crops, it's not the people you kill with swords, although bad enough, or the towns that you've burned, that's bad too but they were destroying crops or pillaging them so that they could eat, which then meant that people are gonna to starve to death because it takes a year for the next crops to come in. So it was plague, famine, pestilence, the whole four horsemen of the apocalypse all at once, right? Here they come uh, for about 30 years, hence 30 year war. And so besides all the, the pain and struggle and misery, what this did is raise the question, where is authority? What is going on? Who's in control? 
We used to think it was the church, but now we've switched church maybe three or four times. Oh, we're a Catholic city. Oh, then we became a Protestant city. Oh, then the Catholics took charge again. Oh, then we went back to being Protestant. Now we're split down the middle, half Protestant, half Catholic. See, it's hard to have that real deep-seated faith in God when God switches four or five times, <laughs> right? It, it, it really upsets. And the king, the king is the divine right of the king or of the nobles who control everything. They're in control. When you live through utter chaos for decades, the nobility use, loses a little bit of the gloss. They're not quite so shiny. If you live in a peaceful time, things are okay, you're not starving, you have some protection, then you can say, oh, okay, well, the Duke's fine, I guess, because look, we're not being despoiled, we're not being wrecked, we're not being ruined. This is one, of, by the way, if you look at Renaissance gardens, um, they were very geometric often. And the message was, if you stick with the Medicis or the Sforzas or whomever, we bring order. Inside of our world is order. Outside of our world is chaos. Which side do you want to be on? And everybody said, oh, we want to be on the side of order because order is much better than chaos, which involves starving, plague, and famine. But that Renaissance dream gets destroyed by the ongoing bloodshed, tension, intellectual revolutions of the Reformation and then the Thirty Years' War. And so as you move out of the Thirty Years' War and into what is called the Enlightenment, you have to understand that the foundation of the Enlightenment is the seeking for new grounds in which to face authority. So where does church authority come from? It's not the Pope anymore, even if you're Catholic and you've gone through all of this, many, many perfectly devout Catholics are asking themselves, wow, all this chaos, all this disorder, all this confusion, what can we found the belief in Catholicism on? And other theologians are asking the same questions. They're not atheists. They're just saying, we need a new foundation. Even people who believe in kings start asking themselves, well, okay, we want to keep a king, but how does a king found his authority? And then people who are looking for knowledge of general kinds, it used to be knowledge came from two sources, the Bible and the classics. And so people start asking themselves, well, where else can we ground knowledge? Now, the answers to these questions vary dramatically. This is what's confusing about the Enlightenment. Different thinkers in the Enlightenment gave different answers to these questions. But the important thing to remember is just asking the questions is totally radical. And it's what did not happen in China. It's what did not happen during the Islamic Golden Age. It's what didn't happen in pretty much the rest of the world. Not that the answers, although some of them became, become hugely important as we'll see, but the questioning and what all the Enlightenment thinkers agreed on was you had to have the freedom to ask those questions. So if you look at the Bill of Rights, which the Bill of Rights and the Declaration of Independence are two of the greatest documents of the Enlightenment. They're basically pure, refined Enlightenment in its most central essence. But the, what's our freedom of speech, freedom of press, freedom of assembly? What these freedom, by the way, these freedoms, as conceptualized by most Enlightenment thinkers, did not include the rabble. This was not about the average person in the street having these rights. They did not care about those people. These people tended to be incredibly elitist. Even when they were being democratic, they were incredibly elitist Democrats. What they meant is people like us, the good people, the smart people, the educated people. We should have the, the right to think what we want, to say what we want, and to assemble with other people to talk about these things. That is, I mean, in its essence, as we'll see, that this is the core. The, the need to question because of the chaos, and then the pressing for the right to ask those questions. And they all centered on this question of how do you ground certainty, knowledge, belief, in a world that had been overwhelmed by chaos. And so again, 
the answers are incredibly variegated. So here's some quotes here that we can go through, but notice this is, this is what they're all doing at, at their core. Um, first one is Rousseau from the incredibly famous social contract. The concept of the social contract is one of the most important political concepts um, ever, ever developed. Rousseau, and Rousseau is the man here. Other, other thinkers at the time, but sort of he came up with the term more or less. We can see from this that the sovereign power, absolute, sacred, and inviolable as it is, does not and cannot exceed the limits of general conventions, and that every man may dispose at will of such good and liberty as these conventions leave him, so that the sovereign never, never has a right to lay more charge on one subject than on another, because in that case the question becomes particular and ceases to be within its competency. So it's, it's hard to narrow a quote from the social contract because it's so rich. Um, but I think this one raises a couple of points. One, we can see that the sovereign's power is absolute, sacred, and inviolable. Right. With the following exceptions. Ah, that's the enlightenment. The fact that the sovereign can do anything they want, say anything they want, for any reason at all, that, the history of that goes all the way back as far as we have sovereigns. Right? They didn't feel that they should be bound by anything. If they had the power, they could do it. If somebody else took the power from them, then they did what they wanted. Right? This was not confusing in the ancient world, even up until the time of the Enlightenment. The state, it is me. Right? This is the you know, famous, I, I'm the king, the state. What are you talking about, the state? The state is me. Ah, no, says Rousseau. It's all inviolable and sacred. Ah, and it does not and cannot exceed the limits of general conventions. What the hell does that mean? The general convention used to be the king said it, therefore it's the general convention. Rousseau is, Rousseau is saying, no, 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 no. The general convention comes from a consensus of the population. Now this is absurd. This is, no, no one had ever thought this before. No one ever thought, oh, you rule by consensus of the population. Machiavelli is the prince, by the way, is sort of leaning a little bit this way, saying it's a lot easier to get things done if the people support you. And so if you have to kill some people to get that, that's okay. But if you have to bribe some people, that's okay. But if you have to be nice to them, that's okay too, because it's just easier. Rousseau takes us a big jump further and says, no, this is necessary. It's the foundation of what happens and how a king draws his power. That's incredibly radical. So at one point he's saying the king's power is inviolable. Why is it inviolable? because it's based on the consensus of the people, which is ridiculous. That's, that's no, that, no king ever said that. I rule because the people are behind me. Well, they said, I rule because I'm the king, and if the people aren't behind me, I simply kill them. That's the history, right? It, it's not, that, that's just perfectly clear. Um, and then he says, the sovereign never has a right to lay more charges on one subject than on another, because in that case, the question becomes particular. And what he means here is all citizens are created equal. We'll see this language in a second. Which again is totally absurd because the whole point of an aristocracy is that you're not created equal. At this time throughout almost all of Europe, the aristocracy was governed by separate laws and other people. The aristocracy could just kill a commoner. That wasn't illegal. It was not illegal in most places in Europe for some, a member of the aristocracy to just kill someone who wasn't a member of the aristocracy. They had their own courts. That's by the way, this is a jury of your peers. Peers meant other nobles. So if you're a duke and you committed a crime, the other dukes would, would be your jury. And the only crimes they're going to find you guilty of are crimes that you commit against other dukes, so you don't do that. Against commoners, who cares? It wasn't an issue. And then you have things like free cities. So people who lived in free cities all over Europe, they had a whole bunch of special rights that other people didn't have. And then you had people who were electors, who elected the you know, emperor. They had special rights that other people didn't have. The priests had special rights. They weren't, you could be taxed. There's all these rules about, and so everybody who was anybody had special rights. That was the whole point. That's how you be, stayed king. You gave some power to people and they supported you and that was the deal. The notion that you don't have special rights is like, that just eliminates the whole social structure that existed at that time. It becomes non-functional which is, of course, what Rousseau wanted. So it sounds like he's supporting traditional kingship, but in fact, he's not. He's trying to base it on this completely new principle of social consensus, hence social contract. Um, 
And so then you can see the ramifications of this in, in the Declaration of Independence, the next quote here. When in the course of human events it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and the nature of God entitle them, a deep respect to the opinion of mankind requires that they should declare the decaux which impels them to the separation. This is Rousseau's theory put into action. We don't like the old social contract, we're going to break it, and we're going to set up a new one. But the laws of nature tell us that we should say why. What? They're just making this up, by the way. This is, no, no one ever thought this. This is just like, oh, we're going to do something. We should say why. No, no, everyone's like, no, you can't do this. You don't just set up. It's like, again, think of it today. California can't just go, oh, we're going to be a state. We're just, well, we'll tell you why we're going to switch from being a state to a nation. Because we should do that if we're going to... No, you can't. You know, we fought a civil war about that several hundred years. You know, but that's the idea. The United States is just going, oh, hey, we can just... If we tell you why, it's all good. If we explain ourselves. Uh, yeah, it didn't work so well. We hold these truths to be self-evident. That all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. That to secure those rights, governments are instituted among men deriving their just powers from the consent of the governed. What the hell are you talking about? This is crazy talk. We hold these truths to be self-evident. By the way, anytime they say self-evident, you know they're trying to trick you, right? That nothing is less self-evident than things that people say are self-evident. I mean, it's really, it's like we hold these truths to be self-evident because we don't have time to make the long, tedious philosophical arguments necessary and no one really buys them anyway. So we'll just move along. All men are created equal, precisely not the case at the time, that they are endowed by the creator with unalienable rights, certainly not the case, and among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Like I said, this is just pure enlightenment happy talk. I mean, it is incredible, it's just like distilled enlightenment. What, what's government for? To make everybody happy. In, in the history of political philosophy, this is pretty much a first. This is not what the Roman emperor said. This is not what the shahs said. This is not what the emperors of Persia said. I don't. Even, I think if you, I would always want to go back in history and read this to them, like the emperors of old, and go, hey, what do you think of this? I think that everybody at the court would just fall down laughing. Like, that is hilarious. At best, they thought bread and circuses, right? Keep them entertained, keep them fed, which keeps them quiet. That's, a, a, that's all you're really trying to do at best. That whatever a form of government consent of the uh, that whatever form of government becomes destructive of these ends it is the right of the people to alter or to abolish it and to institute a new government. Yeah, again, it's the right of the people since when? Says who? Well, it says Jefferson and the founding fathers, of course. Um, and so you get this radical rethought of the foundation of political structures. It's, again. That some conservative thinkers of the Enlightenment said, well, we can re-justify a king. Some conservative, less conservative said, well, we can have sort of a constitutional monarchy. Other ones, like the Founding Fathers, said, no, we see a quasi-democracy. Remember, the, the early American democracy is very, you know, tenuous democracy. But, so the different answers, but they're all the same notion. We need a new reason to found the government. Our current, the old system doesn't work anymore. We have to have a new system. And so, again, different Enlightenment thinkers give different answers, but they're always working around this similar question. New grounds, new foundations, new ways of thinking. To justify sometimes old systems, sometimes to justify new systems. Often it's the same argument. Rousseau's trying to justify a king with the same arguments that are used to justify democracy in the United States. But. It's, it's radically different, regardless of who's making the argument. It's a, it's a new way of founding things. Um, here's another one from Voltaire. You've got to quote Voltaire. You've got to love Voltaire. Once your faith, sir, persuades you to believe what your intelligence declares to be absurd, beware lest you likewise sacrifice your reason and the conduct of your life. In days gone by, there were people who said to us, you believe in incomprehensible, contradictory, and impossible things because we have commanded you to. 
Now then, commit unjust acts because we likewise order you to do so. Nothing could be more convincing. Certainly anyone who has the power to make you believe those certainty has the power to make you commit injustices. If you do not use the intelligence with which God endowed your mind to resist believing impossibilities, you will not be able to command use of the sins of injustice which God planned in your heart to resist a command to do evil. Once a single faculty of your soul has been tyrannized, all the other faculties will submit to the same fate. This has been cause of all the religious crimes that have flooded the earth. Voltaire on questions of miracle. So what is religious faith founded on? Your intelligence. Again, this is, this is, this is a newish argument that your intelligence, you shouldn't believe in miracles because they're absurd. They're, they, you, you know, you can think about it for a second. You go, walking on water seems unlikely. Raising the dead, hmm, probably not. Right? It, it just, why do you believe this crazy stuff? By the way, Thomas Jefferson produced a Bible that they, he cut out all the metaphysical, uh, all the miracles, all the metaphysical stuff. It's very much shorter, by the way. Um, <laughs> but it, it's, 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 very, it's a very different flavor of document. So again, it's not, so there are definitely atheists rolling around in the Enlightenment. It's probably the first time you really begin to see true atheists, um, at least in any sizable numbers. But most Enlightenment thinkers are not atheists. They just are trying to come up with a new foundation for the belief in God. And so it's believers of a new kind arguing with believers of an old kind. And they just completely disagree on what the principle of your belief should be. Should it be blind faith without reason, accepting the dogma of authority? Voltaire says, no, that is absurd. You're abandoning that which makes you human. Don't do it. Because once you give up that, well, now you are just become a tool for tyranny. So he both gets rid of faith and miracles. He also gets rid of the religious authority. Because now who judges the efficacy of religious teachings? You do. Your intelligence does. So that's a huge shift of the balance of power. The Catholic Church used to be able to condemn you to hell if you did anything they didn't like. Now you can say, no, I don't agree with that, so I think I'll just go with what I believe in, and that's good enough. Again, that's a titanic shift. It doesn't mean you don't believe anymore. It just means the grounds of belief are completely different. So many of the, of the, of the Enlightenment thinkers, people will say, oh, well, they're anti-religion. That's not true in any way. There are some Enlightenment thinkers who are anti-religion. Many, many, many more simply want a new ground on which to found religious belief. Very different thing. But again, they're both arguing from the same notion of we need new foundations. So people constantly accuse Voltaire of being an atheist. It seems that he was more along the lines of what was probably called a deist, which is sort of they believed God made the world and went on vacation. Right? There's a God out there someplace, but he doesn't bother about us and we shouldn't bother about him and then we'll just go on about our business. But that's very different from saying there is no God, which again, is, that's a sort of a newish position. Um, so political faith is being rewritten. Religious faith is being rewritten. And also the whole foundation of knowledge itself. So I've got this from um, Newton's Principia Mathematica, which is uh, often cited as the first document of the Enlightenment. Uh, and in there he gives four rules for good thinking, or at least the four rules he's going to use, four laws. And they changed slightly from volume to volume. I think the first edition had three rules, and there were like five, and then like four. But I think the third and more official edition had four rules. Anyway, here's four, and I think these four are the third edition of versions. So you might see different versions of these, because he did slightly vary them. But this, the, the core idea is the same. So here's your rules for, for, for figuring stuff out. Admit no more causes of natural things that are both true and sufficient to explain their appearances. To the same natural effect, assign the same causes. Qualities of bodies which are found to belong to all bodies within experiments are to be esteemed universal. And propositions collected from observation of phenomena should be viewed as accurate or very nearly true until contradicted by other phenomena. Newton's Principia. Now, 
that all sounds very vague, but let's go through these. Admit no more causes of natural things that are both true and sufficient. So shortest possible explanation that seem true and are sufficient. So this is, you know, you could kill a lot of metaphysical dogma, basically Aristotle, um, here by saying, no, no, how, what's the least amount of argument necessary? What's the shortest, sort of an Occam's razor? What's the shortest, easiest, most direct and true, I mean, demonstrably true, you, don't, not, you can't use metaphysical principles, to explain this phenomenon? This is an astoundingly new rule. Second, the same natural effect assign the same causes. So if you see two things that have the same effect, it probably has the same cause. Let's assign that to them. So you don't have 10,000 different fairies that cause 10,000 different events. You look for an underlying unified natural cause for all similar events. So it's this notion that nature is a unified functioning whole. Three, qualities of bodies which are found to belong to all bodies in experiments are to be esteemed universal. Everything, everywhere works the same way. This is, this is an, inc um, so it used to be that the earth was special. We were the center of the universe where God was interested. Everything else sort of just operated out there by different laws. Who knows? It's out there in the ether or it's in the circle of spheres. It's beyond, it's the perfect world, but it's not like here. Right now, Newton says, no, what applies on Earth should probably apply universally. And he meant universally. Remember, he's studying planets and orbits and gravity. You know, he's trying to figure out everything. This is a huge claim that something on Mars does not work different from something on Earth. And it, it starts a whole new way of thinking. What it means is you can do an experiment here that tells you about something that's way out there, at least potentially. And you should assume that how anything works in England, it works that way in France, and it works that way in Italy, and it works that way in China. There are universal principles. And so if they get a different result in China, either you're wrong or they're wrong, but something is wrong. Because the same thing should work the same way everywhere. Universal principles. And then finally, propositions collected from observations of phenomena should be viewed as accurate or very nearly true until contradicted by other phenomena. Truth and falsehood comes from experimentation and observation. This is roughly the foundation of empiricism. This is what's going on. This is a remarkable rewriting of the foundations of knowledge. At this time and for the next couple hundred years, Oxford and Cambridge, just to take two examples, Everybody who was enrolled was supposed to get a theology degree. In fact, this, was so, this continued on so long that Oscar Wilde, a couple hundred years later, had to get a theology degree, which is hilarious. He thought it was hilarious slash irritating. Um, but because where does knowledge come from? True knowledge comes from the church and from the classics. So what did you do? You studied Bible and theology, Latin and Greek. Therefore, you had the two foundations of true knowledge from the Renaissance, by the way. The church and the classics give you the truth. Unless you're interested in phenomena that you observe yourself. Remember, that's where I talk about da Vinci at the end of the Renaissance. This is what he was, this was the argument da Vinci was making. Look, I don't care what all those other people say. I care about what I've experienced, what I've tried, what I've seen. He's sort of the forerunner of empiricism. He makes the argument quite strongly and no one paid any attention to him. Um, I mean, they thought he was fabulous, but he did not have a huge impact yet. But his time was coming. So one thing you can look at in the history of the Enlightenment is that they call it the Scottish Enlightenment. You have you know, Adam Smith and James Watt more or less simultaneously out there. One is rewriting the foundations of economics. One is you know, sort of perfecting the steam engine. But what happened in the Scottish universities is they said, you know what, we think it would be okay for people to run experiments. We think that would be cool. This is a total break. Oxford and Cambridge were really slow to start picking up on this because that's not real knowledge. 
Real gentlemen don't mess about with their hands. Real knowledge does not come from a laboratory. That's where mucky people go. There are exceptions, of course. Lord Kelvin. Wave out to Lord Kelvin, you know. Uh, but that, that, you know, that's the, the idea is it's a new way of conceptualizing the world. So people talk about the advent of technology and scientific revolution, which is coming, by the way. This is one of the outcomes of the Enlightenment. It's on its way. But it's, it's not just that, oh, hey, people are doing experiments. That's cool. And we get some new technology, although very nice. Steam engine, very handy. It's a reconceptualization of how one can derive truth. It's a new foundation of it. And so it was uh, philosophically this incredibly pitched battle. Is, is this really possible? Can we base things on empirical knowledge? Should we allow this? Should people be allowed to do experiments? Should we listen to them? And so, you know, all, basically all the foundations of belief, knowledge, social power, political ideas, e economics are being questioned and re-examined. And the people who are questioning and re-examining them are united, not in their answers, but again, in the desire to be allowed to do that. And so they're not just arguing about what their particular position is, because they often disagree, but about the notion that, hey, I should be able to print what my findings are. I should be able to run my experiments without interference. This is rare, by the way. In fact, perhaps unknown in history. If I think the government's terrible, I should be able to write a bunch of tracts that say it's terrible and suggest a better way to go. And you shouldn't bother me. Kings, rulers, everybody throughout history is unified in their belief that that's a terrible idea. Remember, Socrates put to death. Aristotle flees Athens, right? And Athens was, you know, notably crazily liberal. All the other city-states thought Athens had lost its mind. Socrates tried to go, I mean, Plato tried to go teach on an island. His method uh, was arrested and nearly killed. Only, only, it seems the only intervention of his friends saved him from being executed by the ruler that he was trying to educate. Because he didn't like his ideas. You know, so the, the idea that We'll just forget Roman emperors, right? We're clear that that's, they're not very friendly. Islamic world, not terribly open-minded about a lot of this. And you could do a lot of scholarship and research, but you could not write, hey, about that Allah guy. You know, Muhammad, eh, not so hot on him. But no, 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 no. That is not allowed. We're not going to allow that. In the Enlightenment, not only did people start doing it, they felt like they had a positive right to do it. That somehow they had been wronged if anybody interfered with their capacity to criticize the government, or the church, or the foundations of knowledge, or Aristotle, or the classics. By the way, everyone knows that Galileo was in prison, right, for, for, for blasphemy. Um, what's less clear at this remove for most people is his blasphemy was against Aristotle. It wasn't any particular argument he was making, it's that he was an anti-Aristotelian. And the church was on to him quick. They're saying, wow, if he can get rid of Aristotelianism, sort of the whole foundations of the Catholic theological empire is going to crumble here. We're going to have none of this. So he was placed under house arrest after he recanted, of course, because you know, they, they were going to do worse things to him than put him under house arrest if he per persisted, which he did not persist. Uh, so, you know, that, but it was really his strong anti-Aristotelian arguments as much as any particular claim about the way the planets move or anything else that got him in trouble. Because he's arguing for a new foundation for knowledge. And the church was not interested in a new foundation of knowledge. It had a perfectly good one, it thought. It was about to find out it was wrong, because uh, it did not hold up. And so all of these different forces are combining to create this central concept of the freedom of thought and freedom of expression so that we can bring our questions about, make them real, discuss them with people. And this requires, by the way, a new venue. One of them is the coffee shop, so it's, it's, which is important. A, because everybody should be in coffee shops, uh, as I am all the time. And B, because before, all real activity took place at courts. Large courts, small courts, 
you know, so if you look again, Islamic Golden Age, Al Kendi, Al Biruni, uh, Averroes, they're all working in these court sponsored, very controlled environments, which means the thinkers are in line with the governments. With the advent of the coffee shop and the rise of the middle class, all of a sudden you have this place that's culturally available for people to meet and discuss that is not under the eye of the court. This made the courts very dubious about coffee shops, by the way. They were, they were on again, sometimes closed, often censored. Spies would go in and find out what they were talking about. But groups of thinkers began to form outside of the official sponsorship of the court, which is, again, newish in world history. Not entirely new, but pretty new. And so they're carrying forward arguments and discussing amongst themselves ideas that you could never voice in the court. As Thomas More found out that, you know, you're going to get your head cut off. But, but lots of people were talking about it, but all of a sudden there's this semi-public venue where these ideas can be shared and spread and developed and refined and passed around. Printing becomes cheaper, so ideas can be distributed that way. So this, the Enlightenment brings in a whole new era of thinking and the approach to thinking, which is probably more important. It's not any particular outcome. It's this just fundamental questionings of the foundations of knowledge. And generally, people, where does the Enlightenment end, you know, take a pick? Often it's picked as the French Revolution. Because the uh, Enlightenment also had this incredibly optimistic streak that, wow, if we could just get thinking people, get rid of the, the, the bad kings, get good kings, get rid of bad parliaments, get good parliaments, then we can create a just, noble, virtuous society where just, noble, virtuous people live happily ever after. And then they had the French Revolution, which initially is great to read the responses of the thinkers to the French Revolution, by the way, because most of them in the origin of the French Revolution are like, yes, oppressive bastard monarch, by the way, by historical standards, not that bad of a monarch, but, you know, oppressive bastard monarch, we got rid of them, now great, peace, love, and the goodwill of man will flow. Well, yeah. Then you had the guillotine and you had Napoleon, he was a lot of fun. You know, it, 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 didn't, you know, it didn't work out quite like they were hoping. So I put a big paw over the, the uh, sort of optimism at the core of the Enlightenment, but it didn't stop the ideas. It just made them become more, more complicated and, and subtle and vexed. Um, final note on this, by the way, is often people say, oh, we need to return to Enlightenment values, particularly values of things like reason. And it's important to know that the, the Enlightenment thinkers were pro-man's capacity to reason, but that had been run into the ground by the scholastics. The scholastics were absolute masters of using logic and reason. What the Enlightenment thinkers tended to do, Hume, etc., was say, look, man has the capacity to reason, but we have to put it in the context of the limits of man and the limits of reason. So it has both an embrace of reason and a critique in reason. So Adam Smith, when he talks about, or, or John Locke, when they talk about uh, politics and economics, they try to say, hey, let's look at how people really are. Now, whether they're right or wrong, it doesn't matter. It's just like, let's, let's not have ideal people behaving in ideal ways with ideal outcomes. Let's try and really look, what are the limits of man? How do they actually behave? What are their true motivations? Just asking those questions is new. And one of the first things you see is that people do not behave reasonably all the time. You may have noticed this. <laughs> Occasionally, okay, some of the other people, not us, of course, uh, but some of the other people that populate the planet behave in unreasonable ways. But this is this teeny tiny flaw. If you've ever heard of the Chicago School of Economics, it, it's, its central claim is that man is, a, is an economic animal seeking to maximize personal gain. There's absolutely no evidence that people behave this way. In fact, people behave so stupidly with money, it's as if we're trying to maximize our loss of gain. And in, and in any case, we're totally and completely erratic, individually and in groups. We're, we're, we're just nuts about money as so many other things. 
That's a rationalist argument. That this is precisely what the Enlightenment thinkers, many of them were trying to argue against. They're like, oh, come on. Sometimes I spend too much money on wine and get drunk. Is that rational? No. Is it fun? Yes. <laughs> right? This is perfectly clear. I mean, Diderot made essentially that argument. Uh, he talked about getting this velvet gown that he liked to wear in his, in his office, and he had these chip furniture, and he knew it was all a waste. He knew it was all a bad idea, and he knew he loved it, and he knew he was going to do it anyway. It's like a self-critique. It's beautiful. So that notion of reason, yes, but the limits of reason. That, that it's not just this embrace of, oh, reasoning man is going to save us. They, they were clear this was not going to happen. They did not believe in it. So this is why, if, if you look at something like the way our government was designed, checks and balances. Montesquieu, by the way, he's, he's the originator here, borrowing from Cicero. The idea of like, well, yeah, you don't want to trust the people too much because they're just crazy. They do, one day they want to do this, the next day they want to do that. The example they use is in Athens. They sent this... Uh, mission out to invade this island and they voted on it and the next day they woke up and thought oh that was a terrible idea so they sent a boat out to try and race and catch the fleet before it invaded the island it's like yeah see they're like yeah that's the problem with, with letting everybody vote all the time is on wednesday they vote one way and tuesday they vote the next way you know they're not they're very fickle and then the aristocracy like yeah they're okay but they keep trying to get all the good stuff for themselves so you need like the elite that knows what's going on is invested, in it, but you can't leave them unwatched or else they become an oligarchy and steal everything from everybody else. And of course you want a strong figure that rules, that can make decisions and get shit done, but ah, you don't want a tyrant. And it turns out that when you give one person too much power, they always try to go tyrant on you. And so they, that, right, understanding these limits of humanity was core to the Enlightenment. Now, they disagreed about all of that, but they, 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 many of them, I think pretty much all of them that wrote about this were clear that, look, we're flawed beings, and so we need imperfect systems that sort of balance out in a realistic way the limitations and capacities of humanity, writ large and writ small. So it wasn't like, oh, let's go to reason, it was more like, hey, let's be reasonable, right? Not that it's going to be perfectly logical, but it would be eh, pretty good. No one thought that the, the government that was being set up in the United States was a, this flawless model. Everyone, most commentators thought it was totally unworkable, but everybody else who sort of was in favor of it was like, yeah, that's sort of the best you could kludge together under the circumstances. Let's see if it lasts for a year or 10. Uh, but they felt that way about a lot of things. They were not looking for perfection. They were looking for sort of humane compromises of various kinds. And so as you think about the Enlightenment, and we are children of the Enlightenment, by the way. If, if, if nothing else, we are not children of the Renaissance, I would argue. Um, we are definitely children of the Enlightenment. The whole notion that people say, well, on what basis do you make the decision? That is an enlightenment question. If you've ever asked yourself that, you're asking yourself a question that comes from the enlightenment. It was rare for people, practically unknown, prior to this. Again, Socrates put for, to death for trying to encourage people to ask these kinds of questions. If you thought, oh, well, that person disagrees with me, but that's okay, we can hash this out, wow. This is an enlightenment idea that people who disagree with each other can sort of be okay with that and hash out their differences in an amicable manner. Because again, many of the Enlightenment thinkers did not agree about all kinds of things. But they agreed on the notion that you should be able to argue about what you disagreed about. Which again, is totally new. Basically, in the, in the ancient courts, you did not walk in and go, ah, you know what, king, ruler, shah, pharaoh, I think this is a terrible idea. I mean, it's okay if you want to do it anyway, but you're just as dumb as a post. <clears throat> no, see, this, you didn't do this, because then you got fired at best, uh, exiled or killed, um, as it were, on down the other. You know, just, you're like, okay, everyone, we're going to go along. We'll just go along to get along. That's fine. Whatever the ruler says, be subtle, negotiate behind the scenes, but really direct confrontation. Hey, let's talk about this and debate it and find out the best answer. Yeah, no. Let's just do what I said, or I'll kill you. Right? That, that notion is really an enlightenment notion. 
And two outcomes that we live with today, one, the scientific revolution, which we're coming to. Without an enlightenment, you can't have a scientific revolution for reasons we'll talk about next time. Um, two, this is the distinctive feature. So people ask, okay, it's the Needham question, it's what happened to the Islamic golden age. How is it that Europe, which if you look technologically every other way, in about 150, 200 years, it's gonna control whatever, half the globe, with a tiny population and really not very much of a technological advance, a, a lot of it, as we'll see, rolls out of this. It wasn't the technology, the guns and the ships and steam engines that were crucial, although helpful. It was the capacity to apply systems of government, systems of understanding, systems of cooperation, new economic models, all this conceptual advance. That's what other groups and other cultures did not make at this time. They had not integrated this. The only reason the Enlightenment was able to do it was because the power st structures had so damaged themselves over a hundred years of vicious, vicious, unbelievably, just unbelievably crushing warfare. And, and not in a small way. I mean, there's war, so one example I was trying to think of is the American Revolutionary War wasn't much of a revolution because we got rid of the rulers that ruled in England and replaced them with the elites that were in America. See, that's, that's a change, but it's not like the people who were being ruled in America took over, they didn't. The American elites sort of kicked off the power of the European elites or the British elites. So it was different elites, but there, it was the people who had power before had power after in America. When you look at the Reformation, it is a complete and total, utter revamping of the power structure across the board land ownership, city control, legal systems, uh, jurisprudence, theological systems, uh, state boundaries, borders, allegiances, linguistic foundation, it just you name it, it changed rapidly, relatively, for historical purposes. And so in that fragmented, weakened central control, ah, you had the fertile ground where these people could maneuver. And that maneuvering, which brings you the American Revolution, the French Revolution, all kinds of changes, uh, gives birth to a whole new way of seeing the world, um, and, and, and perhaps most importantly, or in, in very importantly, gives birth to the scientific revolution, which we'll talk about next time. So, the Enlightenment. Thank you very much. <laughs>